السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته رمضان كريم and welcome back to Cyber Night Season 3 My name is Hamad Al-Aqil and uh, we have two very special guests with us here today Mr. Naveen Baratwaj, uh, Chief Growth Officer at Cyber Solutions and Mr. Lucas Stockhausen How are you guys doing today? Great, thank you Very good. Salam alaikum, Ramadan Kareem. We are doing fantastic. And uh, Lucas is the Senior Director for Solutions and Sales Engineering from our partner Synopsys Software Integrity Group. Great to, uh, great to be with you here again on the show, Hamad. And definitely great to have you guys here both. Um, Lucas will be talking to us today. No doubt that you have uh, 15 years of amazing experience. Uh, today, you will be talking about faster and more scalable up. Uh, AppSec through automation, orchestration, and correlation. But before we get into that, uh, would you kindly brief us about yourself, uh, enlighten our viewers, uh, and then we can talk about the main subject. Sure, happy to do that. So I'm I'm in the IT business, um, I would say, roughly since the beginning of the 2000s, so over 20 years right now, um, and I'm in application security since 2008. Um, I started my career as a developer um, um, before getting into AppSec, and then the first time somebody pitched AppSec to me, I somehow immediately fell in love with it because I recognized that this is an, um, a very, very big challenge and issue we have to solve um, across the world. Great, great. I can't wait to uh, to hear from you and uh, me and the audience as well to learn very, very much today. So I would like to hand the mic to you guys and uh, go ahead. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Hamad. Now All let's right. get the party started. We know why we're here, so let's not waste any more time. Uh, Lucas, you know, you, you've got more than two decades of experience. You've seen so much happening. You've seen the, the birth of the software. You've seen the, the transformation of the software industry. There's a very famous quote. There's a very famous uh, saying, software is eating the world. And, and you know, you're already smiling, right? What's your take on that quote? Well, you see, um, I wouldn't say I'm as old Yes, I'm an old guy, and we chatted about that before. I'm not that old that I have seen the inception of software, um, but um, I'm with it, as I said before, since quite a while. So um, what we definitely can see, and I don't have the exact figures in mind, but I think roughly, and you people in the audience can definitely Google that, I think the first challenger had somewhere around a million to two million, a few, low one digit million lines of code. If you look at a modern car nowadays, it has over 100 million lines of code. So it's actually not really a car anymore, right? It's a moving data center. And that's just only one example. Just imagine um, what's going to happen. I got a call from my daughter a couple of weeks ago saying, Um, um, that she can't um, manage her her vacuum cleaner anymore, um, her robot vacuum cleaner, because Alexa had a downtime, right? And that was a global thing. So if you just imagine how all these things work together nowadays, it's really astonishing um, how much we rely on software, really, right? It's it's overall software is existing in all our life. If you think about these mobiles, which we have in our pocket right now, when I remember my first computer that must have been around 84 or something like this was an M80 um, X86, um, right? It, um, I paid a fortune for a 24 needle printer um, in, in order to get it. And that was something which was just like super, super modern, right? And we had on a floppy disk, we could store what? I think it was 720K. Um, each mobile in the pocket has a fortune of more memory and computing power than this high-end computer I had at that point in time. So that is showing 
where we are all ending up, right? And um, it's definitely not going to stop. According to Mark Andreessen from, from this um, famous sentence you were quoting there, um, this, this will be more and more. And yes, we are living in a digital, digital world. We are living in a software world. This is our revolution, um, which we are in the midst of. Yeah, ab absolutely. And uh, speaking about living in a digital world and a couple of examples that you gave around Alexa, we're surrounded by digital natives. And in fact, you know, Saudi has one of the world's youngest populations. I think over 70% of Saudi nationals are under the age group of 35. So what's your advice for the digital natives? Um, well, there is an advice which probably nobody wants to hear right now um, that um, I would, I have to give as an, as a father of digital natives, don't move your complete world digital, right? That's the one advice. Um, and as I said, that's um, the advice nobody wants to hear right now, but go outside as well. Do have some real friends, especially as COVID is going down right now and we can have that um, more again. Um, um, that is very important. But on the other side, if you look at your future, um, embrace this technology, embrace being digital, right? On the other side, stay open. Um, be open for the new things which are coming up because what I can promise you um, is, and I've experienced it myself, if somebody would have told me, um, I don't know, 30 years ago, that I'm going to sit in an office in Dubai recording a session for Saudi as a German, all virtual, I would have never believed it, right? It was impossible to think about. So be prepared for the impossible and stay open for these things. I think that is the most important bit. Don't think you know everything um, because you might know everything which is happening today, but that is not going to be the truth tomorrow. So stay open for all these things. I think that is very important. And on the other side, learn something which can bring you further, right? Which where you can keep up with the future. That is the other um, really, really important part. And talking about software, right? Programming is a very, very important part in that because yeah, we will need more and more software. And so far, well, that is my belief right now. It might be completely wrong, um, but my belief is software will not be developed by itself. Even so, some people think about that already with AI and stuff like that, right? That at one point in time, it will all be um, um, developed by itself. And in 10 years, I might be proven completely wrong, um, but at the moment, I don't have the feeling um, that will be done by um, itself. So, yes, we need young, intelligent, motivated software developers in order to, um, to enhance that. Right. Brilliant. Brilliant. So be digitally savvy, but don't move your entire life to the digital space. Be open to learning. Be pragmatic. Softwares need humans, regardless of people coming up with uh, low code, no code, no human coding, and whatever other new thing that you talk about, right? So great, great pieces of advice. Now, you said the number of softwares are obviously going to go. The number of lines or coding is also increasing. And the number of devices that are dependent on coding is also increasing. So what type of challenges and issues do you think this opens up, uh, Lucas? Well, I think this is something which we see already in the market, right? Open any IT newsletter nowadays, right? It, really, regardless of what this is, um, you will most likely see um, some type of attack going on, right? Some, um, some breach um, where somebody is stealing some data, um, um, say hacking into a system, bringing a system down. Um, so all these things, um, that is one of the big issues. And so what we really need, and that is the other probably advice I, um, I have for everybody who's going into software development, right? Don't only think about just the single feature, 
you have to deliver, but think about as well what else this software might to be used for. I learned that is oh, that is at least 15 years ago. Somebody told me, hey, there is always um, um, software is always has to has to be ready for two cases. One case is what it was programmed for, and the other case is what it is used for. And these two cases have very often nothing to do with each other. So think about what else could your software be used for, and with that, think about what it could be abused for, right? Think about the abuse case. And that is something where um, you really need to be, again, open, open-minded in terms of, um, is somebody going to use my piece of software for something it was never intended um, to be used for, but might be very valuable in order to be used for that? And on the other side, might that create a risk? So, and that is, I think, getting us to our topic right now a little bit more, um, talking about application security. Um, you will hear, and um, as I said before, I'm in this market since 2008, um, you will hear people telling you, well, this software um, has a certain risk in there and can be found with a numerous of different technologies, right? We have static analysis where we look at the source code and find it um, and, and can find potential weaknesses in the application. We have software composition analysis where we, um, where we look at all the open source um, um, bits, how they can add vulnerabilities on top of it. Um, and there are license compliance issues um, which are coming into play. We have DAS, dynamic analysis, where we're trying from the outside looking um, at it and um, see if this can be hacked, if this can be abused, right? We are talking about an abuse case. Um, again, we are, um, we are talking about um, interactive application security where we monitor it from the inside. Um, all these different things where people suddenly tell you, and this is what I tell my salespeople always and my, my, my technical sales engineers, um, that we have to be very careful with it. Um, but where suddenly people come to the developer and tell, tell them that their baby is ugly, right? Um, because it can do something which the developer never intended to do. So again, an advice to the developers, be open for that. Be receptive. Try to understand that potentially somebody is going to use your software in a way it was never intended to be used. And suddenly this is going to create a real, real issue. Um, and um, yeah, be open for that. Allow all these different tests to happen so that at the end of the day, your baby is as beauty as you want it to be and as, as good, as bulletproof as it can be um, nowadays. Um, so that um, yeah, that, that you can um, can be proud of it and and really have it have a secure piece of software because that is, in in all honesty, that is all what we want to do and all we need. We need to make our software more secure because um, we actually have to to make sure, and that is me being a father very important, right? I want to be sure that my kids can live in this computerized software world in a secure way and don't have to be afraid constantly that um, um, something is going wrong, their identity is going to be stolen, um, whatever, right? All these things which can happen. Right. Brilliant. Now, that's, that's a lot, right? We talked about uh, software use cases, abuse cases, risks, uh, software falling into the wrong hands or being used for wrong purposes. And you nicely led us into the security aspect, which I think is one of the major topics of today's discussion, right? How do you bring all these different pieces of the puzzle together and build security by design for softwares and applications? This is something that we'd love to hear from you based on your uh, years of hands-on experience, uh, Lucas. Sure. 
Um, and um, let me let me um, start a short presentation on that. And sure. um, I was talking about all these different bits of software, um, which is testing software, right? Let's say it like that, software, which is testing software, um, all, all these different tests. And I think the big question is, how do we bring all that together? And one thing about that is, is really ASOC, Application Security Orchestration and Correlation, something um, which I... Um, have issues pronouncing every now and then, um, but is actually very important. Um, so, and now my um, pointer is not working. Okay, so um, in the next probably 20 to 30 minutes, I would like to quickly go over, over this. Um, I will give you a short intro in terms of why application security overall is important. And we have talked about that already a little bit. Um, understanding the need um, for application security orchestration and correlation, what that is actually and what it is not, and how ASOC improves efficiency across the SDLC. And that is um, really um, when we are coming to, to the, the core of it. And then obviously why it's worse to, to um, put some investment into that. So if we look at software nowadays, and I told you I'm, I'm in the software business since over 20 years right now, so I've seen a little bit, um, but if we look at modern software, it really changed. Um, and it's ha it has become much more complex than it was 20 years ago. Um, the design has changed, right? 20 years ago, we, be we, we built big monolithic applications, which had all the logic inside. Nowadays, we're talking about microservices. We are talking about serverless um, applications. And the delivery has become faster and faster, right? Um, if you think about um, that, when I started my career, we had, when we were really, really agile, we had a nightly build. Um, um, sometimes we only had a weekly build or a monthly build, right? Very, very slow process, a lot of development, and then we were starting to test that. Today, we're talking about 10 builds a day, 100 builds, hundreds of builds of, um, per day, or even 1,000 builds per day. Um, um, so it's becoming much more agile, much quicker, all this, this bit, which is very good, right? Don't get me wrong. Um, and um, we deploy our software in much um, more ways than we've ever thought of, right? We still have on, on, on bare metal where we deploy software, but mainly we do this in containers right now, in the cloud somewhere. We have IoT devices, edge computing, all these things, right? So it's a wide variety of things um, where this is going to happen. And you see that here, some figures, I will not read all of them um, to you, but you see, for example, Facebook having um, 50 to 60,000 Android builds per day. Um, Amazon reporting um, that they deploy new software every second. The one which is really important or really um, interesting for me is Etsy, um, what you see here on the lower left side, um, which is actually working still with a monolithic application, um, but deploying that more than 60 times a day. Well, if you calculate that by 24 hours, this is getting close to three, bill, three deployments per hour on a big monolithic application. And that is really, really um, a change. So it's not only that we have these small microservices applications right now, which are going to be deployed in that way, but we are um, starting to see that with the big um, monolithic applications as well. So you see it's getting more and more complex, all these things. Well, I was talking about application security testing tools earlier um, already. And um, just to name a few of them again, right? We are talking about static analysis. We are talking um, so SaaS. We are talking about software composition analysis. We are talking about dynamic analysis, um, interactive application security testing. All these different things. Um, we did a survey with Enterprise Strategy Group in June 2021, and what we figured out there from the answers you can read here is that more than 70% of all companies being asked use more than 10 application security testing tools, different application security testing tools. And more than 90% still use more than five 
different application security testing tools. So that is actually a vast majority of technologies which is available there. Um, and the big, big question you have to ask yourself is how, as you asked um, before, Naveen, how you bring all these things together, right? That is very, very important. Well, and then on the other side, you have all these developers being in there, right? And they want to be agile and they want to be fast. They want to bring the next business feature out as quickly as possible to be ahead of their competition, right? Because um, um, the, the second who's going to bring that out is already the loser. So um, we have to be really, really fast. And then you come with the AppSec people in between, um, like me, and saying, mm, stop, not so fast. We need to test all that for security first and making sure um, um, that there is no issue in there. Well, then the developers, including the business, by the way, right? I don't want to blame the developers here. Um, it's including the business, which um, are going to say, sorry, we can't wait on you. You're taking much too much time in order to do your tests. So we have to go live even so we are untested as I said before, in order to be um, in front of the, um, of the competition. Well, what this is going to lead to is insecure software, which is going to be released. And then what, we, what I said before, what we see in the newsletters, um, um, and even in the, in the main press very often right now, that there is a cyber attack um, going to happen. And well, if you look at this here, Ponemon study 2021, um, the average cost of a data breach um, is roughly 4.2 million. So that is an enormous amount of money. And you see as well a 10% increase um, as um, compared to the year before. And if you, um, according to this study, I don't have the actual figure um, for the end of the year, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's even was beyond that. Um, but the estimation there was, was that the global, um, global spending or the global cost for data breaches was six trillion US dollars. Um, so that is an enormous amount of money, as you can imagine, um, which is going down there. I can't imagine how much money that really is. So um, what I would like to discuss with you today about that is, um, um, is application security orchestration and correlation. So what is that? It showed up the first time in the Gartner Magic Hype Cycle in 2019. And you see that here on the, on the raising arm of the Hype Cycle um, when everybody still thought, um, hey, this will solve all our problems. Um, well, in 2021, you see here we are going a little bit um, through disillusionment. Um, obviously, it's not going to solve all our problems, right? Um, that is with all the products. Um, um, none of them is doing that. But it's still playing a very, very important role. And there is something new coming up um, 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 last year as well, which is policy as, the code, as, as code. And we will see how these two things fit together, right? Um, so... If, when we talk, if and when we talk about ASOC, um, we really see, according to Gartner, that ASOC delivers three primary benefits into the AppSec process. It's efficiency. We were talking about all these different tools, right? More than 10, even more than um, 50 tools, right? 5% of the um, companies use more than 50 different application security tools. So um, um, the one bit is, bringing all this data together into one single place, which is already a big, big um, achievement, having that there and, and being able to look up all these um, vulnerabilities in one place. That allows for scalability. Um, so any consistency um, in application security is obviously only possible if you have the same processes across all these different technologies and being able to bring, bring all that together. And finally, and that is obviously the most important bit, accountability. So you can easily report when you have all these things together, um, when was the software tested, what issues were found actually, and were they actually fixed or not? And when these um, this reporting becomes important, that is when you face a breach, right? When there is a breach in your software, and let's be very clear, these breaches happen. We have seen them, um, but you need to be prepared for it. The first thing somebody will ask you is, when has this software been tested the last time? And what were the results? And if you then need to go into 50 different technologies in order to figure out 
when the last te test happened and um, what issues were actually found and what issues were fixed, then you have a daunting task. If you have all that together in one application, um, then that source AppSec testing tools. It must normalize and correlate the findings and we will come to what that means exactly um, in a later slide. And finally, it must provide orchestration capabilities. So these are the three core requirements which Gartner puts on an ASOC tool. Um, what is not, right? Very often it's much easier to define what something is by making very clear what it is not. It's not an additional scanner. It might have an additional scanner on board um, or S, S, no, not an additional scanner. It might have a scanner on board, a scanner which you could deploy in any other way as well. But by itself, ASOC is not just another scanner. And it's very clearly not just an aggregation tool. Even so, the aggregation of bringing all these data together um, is important. Um, it's not just an aggregation tool. That is very clearly. So what makes a good ASOC tool, right? That's a, um, a totally different question. We understand right now what is an ASOC tool or what an ASOC tool has to bring, but what makes an, a good ASOC tool? Correlation. And I was talking about that as one of the core requirements um, for an ASOC tool already, but a good ASOC tool should have a good correlation as well. Correlation um, and analysis of results from a wide range of AppSec testing tools for each single application. And that is an important bit here, right? For a single application. So you are testing, just as an example, your application with two different SaaS technologies. So let's just name two um, out of curiosity here. I pick two. One would be um, check marks and the other would be coverity, right? You run static analysis with um, these two technologies on your application. Why are you doing that? Because of you want to um, um, have defense in depth um, and, and just want to get the best results possible. So you do that with these two tools. And what you want to make sure right now is that the overlapping findings, which are found by these two technologies, um, are actually marked as the same issue um, as well, right? And that would be what correlation is. If you would only look at the check marks portal, you would, um, I don't know, let's say you see 100 issues and you look at the coverage portal and you see another 100 issues and it might be that 60 of those 100 issues or 90 of those 100 issues are the same. The ASAC tool should exactly figure those out and then say, okay, and these 10 issues or whatever um, are actually different. Um, that is um, the, set, uh, the bit. Integration with defect tra tracking systems for all AppSec testing tools. Very, very important. Imagine you have only 10 application security testing tools and you need to integrate all these 10 technologies with your defect tracking system, let's say Jira, just for, for the sake of naming one. Um, means you have to have 10 bi-directional integrations um, into your JIRA. If you have more AppSec testing tools, you need more um, integrations, right? Just imagine all the maintenance. You're going to change one field in JIRA. Um, you need to um, um, adopt this, the, all these 10 integrations. So the ideal situation of an ASOC tool is it takes away all these single integrations and you have the integration from just this one place, which allows you then as well to have the benefit of the correlation that you do not report those issues which were correlated two times into, into your JIRA, but only one time. You see how reliable technology can be sometimes. Um, not always the best. So let me kick in here again, right? Orchestration um, um, does mean that, you, um, that you're capable to see all the different tests which have been executed um, so that you can report on when the last test actually has been executed and, and see that in the ASOC tool. It's not necessarily meaning that you, um, that you really kick off the test out of the ASOC tool, but you have to, under, um, have to understand that. Um, okay, normalization of results acro across all AppSec testing tools and across application. What the heck does that mean right now? So 
Um, normalization actually means we have our different testing technologies again, right? So we were talking about check marks and coverity um, before. So let's just assume we are testing two different applications, one with coverity and the other one with check marks. Um, the likelihood of them finding very similar um, weaknesses or vulnerabilities is relatively high, but the likelihood of them being named differently um, is pretty high as well. So put a dynamic application security testing tool into the mix right now, it will name it completely um, or potentially different as well. So let me just give you a very simple example on that one, which would be SQL injection, right? Let's say Checkmarks is going to call that persistent SQL injection. It means there is some data stored in a database which is going to kick off an SQL injection. Coverity might name that stored SQL injection, right? It's meaning the same thing. Typically in dynamic tools, this is called blind SQL injection because you don't see that anymore, right? So these are actually three different names which are talking about the exact same thing. Normalization means exactly that, bringing all these vulnerabilities, which are in different applications um, or in the same application, to the same naming, so that you can understand that, um, that you're actually having this type of a vulnerability um, across your application portfolio and that you need to train the developer um, on on, these, um, on this vulnerability potentially, because that might be the highest um, risk in your, in your business. And then finally, and that is pretty, pretty obvious in all honesty, um, reporting, right? We have all this data together. We have normalized it. We have correlated it, right? We have all that in one box right now. So we should actually do the reporting in there. So obviously an ASOC tool, a good ASOC tool should have a very, very decent um, reporting, um, um, should have very decent reporting capabilities um, so that you can run all your reporting from there. And with that, getting into risk analysis already, right? Don't get me wrong. It's not going to replace a GRC tool. Um, um, that is a different beast again, but it can be a great starting point in order to report into a um, GRC tool, or if you only need a high level risk analysis that might be already done in an ASOC tool. So bringing all that together, what challenges um, solves in an ASOC tool, right? If we come back to one of the very early slides, the main frustrations of a developer are, um, you see here in point three, for example, security testing slows us down. We have, um, if you go higher in that um, row, inconsistent approach, lack of automation, all these things can be solved by, a, um, by an ASOC tool um, um, because all these, um, or oh, why do we need to solve them? Because, um, it's um, they're creating developer resistance and that is going to give us a compliance issue. So this is why we want to solve them. Um, how do we solve them? Well, one of the big issues and that is slowing down, right, is pipeline congestion. And this is where policy as code is coming into the place. So pipeline congestion actually means with all these technologies which we are running, we really like within a traffic jam, if, if you look at any city traffic, um, we are putting more and more cars in, in it. And at one point in time, we see the congestion, we see the traffic jam. In this case, we see, see the pipeline congestion and the pipeline is not moving forward. It's getting slower and slower and sometimes it stops. So um, what we need to do here, and that is where policy as code, which I mentioned in the beginning is coming into the play. Um, we need to intelligently decide with orchestration and policy as code when to run which scan. Um, because the fastest scan we can run is a scan we don't run. Um, and if it's not necessary to run a scan, then it's best to skip it. We obviously have to do that based on policies and we have to be able to report on that. And this is why we need the ASOC technologies. But um, um, just imagine you have changed in your software, you are developing, you have changed some lines of code um, um, in the source code, but you've not touched all your open source components. So why running another software, um, um, another um, SCA test, software composition analysis test? It's not necessary, right? It just only slows you down. Or opposite around, you have not touched a, um, a line of source code. You've just changed a few open source components. You don't need to run a SaaS test, right? So 
intelligently decide based on what has been done in the development, deciding what is um, what is necessary that is going to reduce the test and then moving the tests earlier on and make them on smaller bits so they can run faster that may actually means decentralizing all that so you can actually um, get the traffic jam away um, and um, overall running faster so that's the um, the one bit where this can help the other bit is the findings management um, so you can really um, um, underscore the more tools, let's start it like that. The more tools you're putting in there, the more findings you will have. Um, and that is where correlation can help you um, so that you don't have to review all these findings by itself, um, um, but only you need to review them once. Um, and that will um, actually help in the, in the findings management. So this is how the work of an application security guy looks nowadays when he's not using an ASAP technology. Um, he has to go into all these different environments, look at the issues, um, um, triage them, um, probably put them manually into an Excel sheet, um, 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 do a false positive triage. And if you think about this is taking 10 minutes uh, per finding, this is really a daunting task. What? Oh, then, and then he's putting... Potentially, if he's lucky, he has some homegrown integration from a central tool, but most likely he's putting a button, pushing a button on all these different technologies in order to push the, um, the remaining issues into JIRA. So that is a really, really um, heavy workload. What if we put all these technologies right now behind an ASOC tool? and move all that data into this one single bit um, where you get a unified um, um, visibility on your risk. You can run normalization as we discussed. You can run correlation um, as we um, discussed. You see the orchestration when which um, scan actually has been executed or you even kick off the scan from the ASOC tool. And you have on top of all that, you have a triage assistant, so a machine learning, which helps you to understand, well, the last, 20 times, you had this type of an issue triaged like this. This looks from all the context very, very similar. So most likely, this is a high priority issue again, right? And you can um, just, just um, take it like that. And then you have one place from there in order to put it into your JIRA and um, have the bidirectional integration with JIRA. That is a much, much easier task to accomplish right now. So if we take that apart and put that a little bit into the software development lifecycle, you see here the intelligent orchestration I was talking about with the policy as code, where you make an intelligent decision on which scan um, to execute. You have then all your developers actually communicating with the ASOC technology um, and don't have individual integrations into all the um, all the individual um, technologies anymore. Um, you can run central training um, on, on that part. You have all your CI CD pipelines reporting into this ASOC technology that is in combination with intelligent orchestration so that you actually finally get one system of record. So there is um, actually only um, one final question right now, probably um, 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 staying over um, why it's worth the investment for all this. Um, it obviously allows you for higher speed, for lower cost of the total ownership of all these technologies, because all, all your remediation is going to be faster, your triage is going to be faster, right? The faster we are, that the cheaper um, it gets. Um, that is obviously always um, achieved with reduced friction. Um, you get continuous feedback um, um, from that. And with that, you can actually continuously report on compliance. And that was me talking very, very long right now. Um, um, just wanted to see if there are any remaining questions on, on all that. Oh, well, uh, Lucas, firstly, thank you so much for that fantastic presentation. And I think uh, a session like that is definitely going to have a few questions coming your way. <laughs> so uh, we, we, know, we, we talked about a lot of different areas. As in, you talked about a lot of different areas. And uh, uh, conceptually and practically, we learned a lot. Can you elaborate on the type of tools or technologies that are out there in the market that can actually help achieve some of the things, if not everything that 
you presented in your uh, in your slides? Well, as you can imagine, um, um, such a presentation, even so, this is um, purposely very generic because ASOC, and first of all, is a concept, right? It's not like one individual tool, um, 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 but it's not just created as an academic exercise, right? Um, so Synopsys has a technology called CodeDX, um, um, which can do all these things. Um, we are integrating with over 100 different application security techn testing technologies. Um, and that is purposely, we are very, very vendor neutral there, right? Because even so, we would love that all, all our customers only use Synopsys tools, right? Um, the reality, um, well, we don't have 50 tools. So at least this 50, 5% of, of, of all, all the accounts out there which are using more than 50 tools, right? They have to use some other tools. Um, but still, they need this integration. So this is purposely vendor neutral. Um, and we can really integrate, as I said, with over 100 um, different technologies. If that is not enough for you, and you're using some homegrown things as well, um, then there is an open SDK as well uh, available where you can integrate your own technology um, um, on top of that. So that is, um, um, as I said, the name is CodeDX there and, and is available um, immediately um, for for every customer to be to be looked at to be looked at fantastic fantastic thank you so over 100 plus integrations vendor neutral lots and lots of customization so the asoc story that you presented today or the concept that you presented today i'm glad it's not just an idea it's actually an idea that can be implemented with a combination of different tools and uh, technologies. And I'm also glad that uh, Synopsys is leading the way in making the ASOC happen in helping build softwares that are secure by design. One last question from my side. Uh, the session has been running for the last 40 minutes. Lots of amazing content there. But if I were to ask you to summarize everything that we talked so far in less than two minutes what would that sound like <laughs> well <laughs> if, if we skip out the general advice um um into into young digital natives of um, um having a little bit of a life outside of the digital world as well if we skip all that and talk about asoc right i would summarize asoc as three core capabilities right we talk about correlation being able in one um, from from different tests saying this is um, as one application so different tests on the same application these are actually the same issues right that is the capability number one of ASOC capability number two the important one for me is prioritization so being able to automatically identify which issues are most important. Why is that so important? Well, A, there are tons of issues being found, and B, there will never be enough time. Let's be very honest as well, right? There will be never be enough time to fix all issues. So you need to be, we need to decide very cautiously which issues to fix first in order to reduce the highest risk. And that is something where prioritization can really help you and where machine learning is really, really effective because it can see it from a very neutral point. There is no gut feeling um, involved anymore. Um, um, and that is very important. And the third bit for me, and um, I might be a little bit different than some others there, but the third very important um, bit for me is normalization, right? You have your 20, 30 different technologies and they name all their weaknesses, vulnerabilities, whatever, which they find differently. It's very, very important to bring them on a common name to understand not only in a single application, but for the application security um, people and, and for the risk people, getting an overview across all applications, right? That is really important. So that allows normalization because otherwise you have to keep in mind, if you're using 20 tools, you most likely have to keep in mind 
10 different names at least um, for the same type of vulnerability. And this is why normalization is very, very important for me. So just to say that again, it's correlation, um, prioritization, normalization. These are the three important points for me in, APSA, in, in, in ASAR. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Lucas. You spoke to us as a father. You spoke to us as a software engineer. You spoke to us as a technology and security enthusiast and an evangelist. Thank you so much for some amazing thoughts, some amazing tips and advices, as well as those three points that helps beautifully conclude our today's session at Cyber Nights, organized by the Saudi Federation for Cybersecurity Programming and Drones. Thank you for your participation, as well as Hamad. Thank you for uh, having us on your show. Thank you for inviting Spire Solutions and our partner Synopsys Software Integrity Group to be part of uh, the CyberNight series. And I can only say thanks for having me. Um, it was a great pleasure to talk to you. It was a pleasure to have you both here. And uh, what uh, a rich amount of valuable information for uh, old and young, such as yourself, viewers, uh, it was amazing. It, uh, I enjoyed it very much and learned very much today. It was a pleasure having you both. Thank you very much. Thank you.